This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. It's Kids Night. Find your seats, kids. This is episode 25. I bet you kids are excited to hear the story of Wheelbarrow Man. Yes, he was an ultra-running superhero, a lot like Superman, but his superpower is able to push a wheelbarrow really far. Wheelbarrow Man dodged speeding bullets, ran away from trains and cows, and was able to leap into buildings with saloons. In 1878, a long, long time ago, he pushed his wheelbarrow all the way across the United States. He made friends with the Indians and even found a wild wolf who he made his sidekick. His name was Smokey the Wolf. Are you ready for the story of the wheelbarrow man? Now for the story of the wheelbarrow man. In recent years, some of the ultra runners who have run across America performed it by pushing baby joggers to carry their stuff in a self-supported mode. Once when my friend Phil Rosenstein was pushing his jogger along a highway during his transcontinental run, an alarmed passing motorist called the police and reported that a crazy person was pushing his baby along the busy highway in a baby carriage. In the general public's mind, it was just too crazy to imagine someone running across the country pulling or pushing a contraption. What about pushing a one-wheeled wooden wheelbarrow across the country? That is exactly what Lyman Potter of Albany, New York did in 1878. He was one of the earliest known ultra-walkers to legitimately walk across America. He became known as the Wheelbarrow Man. The country was fascinated by him, But behind his back, he was called by many an idiot, a lunatic, and a fool. Why would anyone want to push a wheelbarrow across America, especially across the West, when there were just rough wagon roads and a few railroads? This is the story of the wheelbarrow man, who would eventually be called, quote, the hero of the greatest feat of pedestrianism. Richard Lyman Potter was born about 1840 in Marietta, Ohio. His father was an inventor, establishing patents. In 1862, the Potter family moved to Albany, New York. Lyman Potter then served as a private in the Civil War. He returned to Albany where he worked with his father in patents and later as a plumber, an upholsterer, a cabinet maker, and a mattress maker. In 1875, at the age of 35, he was a widower. His wife likely died in childbirth the year before. He was left to raise two daughters, Bertha, age four, and Harriet, an infant. They were cared by a live-in nanny housekeeper, Mary Robinson. His furniture business soon experienced hard times, so he did odd jobs about the city to support his family. He was a smaller man, about five foot, eight inches, 137 pounds, and wore a long, straggling black beard and long hair. In 1878, Potter, age 37, and some friends were discussing the exploits of the famous pedestrian Daniel O'Leary. They started to banter about this and that, including whether any of them could walk for 100 consecutive hours. Potter said that that was too easy. And before he knew it, a $1,000 wager resulted challenging Potter to push a wheelbarrow all the way from Albany, New York to San Francisco, California. That's crazy. There were many individuals who put up money for the $1,000 purse, which was deposited in a bank for Potter to collect if he was successful. Potter explained, It all came from too much talk. We was talking about work and earning money in hard times. And I said I'd wheel a wheelbarrow to San Francisco for a dollar a day rather than be without work. The Albany fellows took me up. I had nothing to do, and I wouldn't back down. 
The terms of the wager required that he make it to San Francisco in 215 traveling days and in no more than 250 total days, and he must walk up to 4,085 miles during that time. He was not to travel on Sundays. Why was he truly doing it? He figured that he could make some money, take many photographs, and write a book about his experiences along the way. A newspaper stated, He is like the rest of mankind, on the make, and is not doing all this wheelbarrowing for glory. Potter's unique wheelbarrow was made specially for the trip. It was constructed as a box and weighed less than 45 pounds, although it looked heavier. When loaded with his things, it weighed up to 75 pounds. A covering protected his luggage from the elements. It was painted, quote, drab blue with red trimmings. Lettering was painted on it that read, From Albany to San Francisco in 250 days, Sundays off, 215 days. On the end, toward the wheel, was a little flagstaff with the United States flag. At the other end, directly in front of him, was a receptacle for a tin cup and a book for signatures. A box inside contained necessary clothing, provisions, camping conveniences, and other necessary luggage. He was required to push the vehicle without the aid of any strap or other device. See the article on ultrarunninghistory.com for pictures of this amazing contraption. Reaching California was Potter's dream. He rolled out from his home in Albany on April 10, 1878 in drenching rain with only $3.55 in his pocket. He needed to reach San Francisco by December 15th, taking off 35 Sundays. His first day's journey to Schenectady, New York, of 16 miles was horrible. He arrived footsore, wet, tired, and somewhat dispirited. It also rained the next day. He reached Utica, New York in six days after 125 miles and was tempted to quit. He might have done that if it hadn't been for the negative tone in the newspaper. I intended to get through without making any stir or attracting any attention in the papers, but I had got to Utica, New York, when they began to talk and blow. They ridiculed him, calling him an idiot, tramp, and a brainless fool, predicting that he would fail. After reading that, he was resolved to push on. Potter traveled across upstate New York on a wagon road turnpike and averaged 30 miles per day. He reached Buffalo about 350 miles on April 25th, day 15. He was starting to get a lot of attention on the road and through the towns and cities. Imagine seeing a man with very long hair and a long beard pushing a very strange contraption with a lot of graffiti written on it passing you on the road. It was reported, his appearance in front of the post office on the Seneca Street this morning naturally attracted a good deal of attention. Well, the wheelbarrow is a mighty fine tool. I think it's pretty groovy. I think it's pretty cool. It saves my back from aching and it makes me smile. It hauls them wood chips all around and it bumps and it bounces up and down all along the bottom of the old mulch pile. In early May, after traveling through rainy weather over difficult muddy roads, he reached about the 600 mile mark at Cleveland, Ohio and stayed for two days. He went to the post office for his mail, stopped off at a saloon for the afternoon, and then continued on to a boarding house. That was the typical daily pattern he used when he arrived into towns. The newspaper wrote, Potter is an eccentric individual, both in appearance and in speech. He would impress the stranger neither with his greatness nor with being remarkable in any particular. He walks with a sort of easy shuffling gait, nor lifting his feet very high from the ground, nor stepping very far at a time. He seems to enjoy the notoriety he is gaining. At Tiffin, Ohio, about mile 700, much of the city folk were anxious for Potter to arrive. Someone pulled a prank and disguised himself with false hair and whiskers and pushed a wheelbarrow toward the town a few hours before the true Potter arrived. 
businessmen and everyone who could find the time swarmed around the bridge crossing over to the city. Sure enough, there was the wheelbarrow man with a man on horseback following him. They came in at a rattling pace and passed through a cheering crowd. The real potter arrived at Tiffin a few hours later in cold and rainy weather. He was in good spirits but suffering from exposure. Once the people figured out that they had been tricked, they came back out by foot or horse carriage to cheer him into the city. Newspapers didn't hold back on how stupid they thought this journey was. One stated, Another lunatic is abroad. It bothered him that he was being called a lunatic idiot and king of tramps. They're coming to take me away, ha-ha, they're coming to take me away, ho-ho, hee-hee, ha-ha, to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time, and I'll be happy to see those nice young men in their clean white coats, and they're coming to take me away, ha-ha! Potter entered Indiana. He reached about mile 850 at Fort Wayne, Indiana on May 16th, day 37. He had been pushing his load on the Wabash Railroad tracks. At the city, he was met by a delegation of city officials along with a large crowd. By then, his wheelbarrow was covered all over with business cards and advertisements. In his wheelbarrow was a box that contained, among other things, a rubber coat, a change of underclothing, and some medicine. The medicines were mostly for his feet, tannin and carbolic salve. You see, when I first started, my feet got very sore, and I had to doctor them a good deal. But they are quite tough now. I carry along everything but whiskey. That I can get plenty of along the route. Potter had a book of autographs of the people that he met every town, village, and farmhouse. An example entry read, I saw Mr. R. Lyman Potter at Monroeville, Ohio. I left town about five or eight minutes after Mr. Potter started and trotted on my horse one and a half miles before I overtook him. I rode aside him for four and a half miles and found it quite difficult to keep up with him without trotting. I have a fast walking mare. Mr. Potter is a very sociable man and seems to be a very good man. Greeted by a large crowd, Potter trundled into Plymouth, Indiana on May 20th. He was about six days ahead of schedule, still averaging about 26 miles per day. It was reported, He is dressed in a suit of butternut brown and wears a broad-brimmed white wool hat. He walks easily and rapidly. A crowd and a brass band led him into town playing, See the Conquering Hero Comes. Potter said of his long hair, If the Indians scalp me, they won't be disappointed, but will get a handful of hair. Potter reached Chicago, Illinois on May 23rd, day 44, looking weary and tired of the job. He was about 10 days ahead of his schedule. One reporter called him the wheelbarrow idiot and described him. He is represented as being the most dilapidated looking biped that has worn shoe leather in these parts for a considerable period. The pants that encase his slender limbs would make a tailor heart sick. He wore a pair of shoes with white canvas boots that looked as though pedestrianism had run into Potter's family for generations back, and each of his ancestors had worn them across the continent several times. His hands are gloved, and the wheelbarrow which he rolls before him, letting the handles rest in the hollows of his arms, is a small box. Potter claimed that he wasn't begging along the way, but was willing and glad to accept a meal from anyone who saw fit to give it to him. To make some money, he put advertisements on his wheelbarrow as he passed through towns and cities. In towns, crowds followed him to plan visits to saloons, and he received a share of the profits. He also made money by accepting letters to be delivered to California for 25 cents each. As he earned money, he sent some of it home to support his children. Potter arrived in Des Moines, Iowa on June 14th, day 66, where a large crowd gathered around his hotel to the great discomfort of its patrons. 
it was observed. His health has improved daily ever since he started, all but one shin, which is considerably swollen. He walks in heavy-soled army shoes. At Council Bluffs on the Missouri River, he received a special permit to cross the river on a railroad bridge, but was only allowed to cross on Sunday when there were fewer trains, so he was delayed for a couple days. At Omaha, Nebraska, Potter first followed an old military road to Fremont, Nebraska, and then jumped on the Union Pacific Railroad, which he would use all the way to Ogden, Utah. While in Nebraska, Potter said he ran into some railroad tramps or hobos. They demanded tobacco, and he gave them half his store of weed. Then they wanted whiskey, and when he told them that all the whiskey he had with him was to be used to bathe his shins when walking caused them to swell, they knocked him down and reviled him. He drew a pistol, of which he carried several, and frightened them off. Thus was the whiskey saved for legitimate use. Near Ogala, Nebraska, a frontiersman named Ash Hollow Bill used Potter's wheelbarrow for target practice and smashed one of the springs with a rifle ball. After a good 40-mile day near Sydney, Nebraska, it was reported that he was frequently chased by cattle. That might have been why he had such a high mileage day. On July 20th, day 102, Potter reached Cheyenne, Wyoming. They gave him the freedom of the city, and then the hoodlums who were abroad there got hold of him and filled him up with booze. He was very drunk when reporters tried to get a story out of him. His wheelbarrow was now stuffed with letters for California. The Eastern press was pretty brutal about Potter's journey. Commenting on a heat wave, it was written, if the sun would quit fooling with St. Louis and attend to business around that wheelbarrow, it would earn the gratitude of America. Also, the wheelbarrow idiot has reached Laramie City unscalped. Oh, when will the Indians get to their work? At Table Rock, Wyoming, Potter was confronted by a mountain lion that started to follow him. The report included, Potter kept backing, and the beast pursued for nearly two miles, and then turned off. A little further along, he came upon a small Indian encampment. Potter opened his box and presented them with what tobacco he had. Potter wrote, I have not lost my scalp yet. I have met lots of Indians, but all seemed quite friendly. They were quite amused with him and didn't believe he was a threat. One Indian mother named her baby Wheelbarrow and hoped that he would grow up to be a good walker like Potter. They liked him so much that they invited him to come live with them. He thought about returning and living with them. Near Hanging Rock, Nevada, someone threw Potter a bottle of beer from a passing train. He was very thirsty and drank the entire bottle. Within a mile, he was seized with violent pains in his stomach and knew that he had been poisoned. He ate butter and drank salt water that caused him to vomit out the poison, but he was still sick and had to stop for several days. Potter reached Winnemucca, Nevada on September 18th, and he stayed at the Central Pacific Hotel. He joined in with the boys at the local saloon and bought drinks for them for a half dollar. The local paper wrote, Unless he succumbs to the influence of whiskey, he will accomplish his task with ease. He had added some antelope horns to decorate his wheelbarrow. Between Wadsworth and Reno, Nevada, Potter camped out one night with his timekeeper. They found some railroad ties and threw up a little enclosure about breast high and in the night were fired upon by some fellows who ran off into the darkness. A ball cut Potter's coat sleeve. Potter returned fire with his six-shooter and thought that the men may have been wounded. Crossing over the Sierra Nevada into California was difficult because of all the trestles to cross and dodging all the trains. He trundled his barrel over the bare trestles six and eight miles in extent, guiding the wheel along the inner foot of the rail 
walking himself on the ties, and approaching trains would see him in these positions invariably slacked up to give him the time to get across. He passed through the 40 miles of snowsheds across the Sierras without molestation, camping one or two nights in the sheds. The barrow is supplied with springs. The jolting over the ties doesn't bother him much. On about October 5th, day 179, Potter arrived at Sacramento, California, followed by a crowd of several hundred men and boys to the city hotel. The Sacramento paper reported, Potter is a fine-looking man of splendid physique. There is not the slightest sign of a madman about him, but on the contrary, he exhibits the elation of the winner in a long and arduous contest against him. He continued to Oakland, walking on the railway, and then walked another railway to San Jose where he arrived October 18th, day 192. He went on to the suburbs of San Francisco and stopped for about a week. Potter's official entrance into San Francisco was October 27th, day 201. Potter proceeded to the very popular Woodward Gardens in the Mission District where he had been hired to appear. It was a combination amusement park, museum, zoo, and aquarium. The press called him the hero of the greatest feat of pedestrianism and notorious as the wheelbarrow man. He came into the city by police escort and led by a band in the gardens when an eager crowd of up to 15,000 people were gathered wanting to get a glimpse of him. An Oakland paper mocked, He now is in common with the other monkeys on exhibition at Woodward Gardens. Potter received a salary to appear at the gardens and would earn $250. An editorial stated, Potter's performance is neither wonderful nor praiseworthy. He is simply making a show of himself for so much money. Another stated, The long protracted agony is over. About his treatment by the press, it was said, He complains of the bitter and sarcastic comments of the Eastern press, but says he is becoming accustomed of hearing himself called a fool and a lunatic. At Woodward's Gardens, Potter walked every day in front of a large crowd to add 90 miles to reach the required 4,085 miles. He officially finished on November 8th, day 213. Potter intended to wheel back to Albany. Leon Pierre Fettermeyer of Paris, France, challenged him to a wheelbarrow race from San Francisco to New York for $1,500. Potter accepted and was sponsored by Pacific Life. The two started on December 8, 1878. They agreed to stay fairly close to each other until Cheyenne, Wyoming for safety. Fettermeyer's wheelbarrow became somewhat damaged when he was blown off a high railroad trestle up in the mountains. In the Sierra, they survived mostly on bread and crackers and some days went without food. Storms would delay them for many days and they confronted snow as high as two feet. Fettermeyer suffered from frozen feet. Temperatures reached 16 below zero. The two successfully made it over the Sierra and arrived at Reno, Nevada on Christmas Day. At Battle Mountain, Nevada, they parted because Potter couldn't keep up. When Potter arrived in Ogden, Utah, Fettermeyer was far ahead near Cheyenne, Wyoming. But Fettermeyer didn't take a required route through Salt Lake City, Utah, cutting off about 80 miles, and Potter considered that he had forfeited his right to the winnings. Potter wasn't in any hurry to win this race. His main objective seemed to be making money. He arrived in Denver at the four-month mark, but took a huge detour to the mining town of Leadville, Colorado to perform in a variety show for several weeks. One day Potter wheeled his barrel 50 miles in 12 hours in the brand new Tabor Opera House in Leadville. Fettermeyer reached Topeka, Kansas about 650 miles ahead of Potter, who was still in Leadville. There was rumors in Kansas that Fettermeyer had cheated 40 miles taking rides on the railroad. Potter finally left Denver and continued his journey east, about six weeks of performing, but had decided to finish at his leisure. In Kansas, he ran his wheelbarrow off an embankment 20 feet and busted it up badly. Potter was collecting all sorts of things as he ambled on, including a live wolf he found in Kansas and a couple of squirrels. After nearly eight months, 
Federmeyer arrived in New York on July 24th, 1879, pushing his, quote, quaint-looking wheelbarrow marked from San Francisco to New York. He signed an affidavit that he had walked the entire distance. Potter was more than 1,000 miles behind in Centralia, Illinois. An article joked, The wheelbarrow is a great institution. The young men of the period have largely abandoned it as a highly unfashionable article of furniture. The race may lead to something useful. We may even find hoeing matches introduced among our field sports. Potato digging may yet take the place of polo. Well, the wheelbarrow's one of my favorite implements. Whoever invented that thing had good intent. It sure has saved me a whole lot of toil and tears. When you got something good, you ought to just stick with it. When you got something bad, you ought to say to heck with it. And the wheelbarrow's design ain't changed in a thousand years. Potter really slowed down to a crawl and created a traveling show displaying his wheelbarrow and the items he brought back with him. It was said he had 1,600 curiosities. All who have seen it have been highly pleased. Among his curiosities were tarantulas, centipedes, scorpions, white rattlesnakes, Indian relics, horned toads, a prairie dog, and his live wolf. In August 1879, Potter was in St. Louis and slowly spent all of the next two years inching toward New York, sometimes spending months around the same city. After two years of racing like a snail, in January 1880, Potter reached Cincinnati, Ohio. During the summer, he put on exhibitions near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He spent the winter of 1880-81 in Baltimore, Maryland, reaching his third year returning to New York. Gonna trade my wheelbarrow, gonna trade my wheelbarrow. During May 1881, in Washington, D.C., a reporter recognized 41-year-old Potter walking on a street in the capital city. He was described as, quote, A gaunt-looking man with long, unkept hair and beard on a careworn face. His hollow eyes were shaded by the wide brim of a weather-stained slouch hat. His coat was a sort of ragged buckskin tunic. Are you the wheelbarrow man? Yes, are you a reporter? A curious crowd collected, making it impossible to interview him, so Potter invited the man to the place where he was staying. He first introduced the man to his wolf. I can do anything with him. I got him near Fort Wallace, Kansas. Potter took the man out to a shed. He focused the rays of light from a candle to a corner, bringing into view an old, worn wheelbarrow. On it was packed many boxes, bundles, blankets, a frying pan, and other things. The wheelbarrow looked as though it would not stand another ten miles of travel. The whole establishment looked like its owner, about all worn out. He had a large number of curiosities, including snakes and specimens picked up along the road, and several books filled with signatures and seals. I have walked 15,000 miles. Out west, I never had to pay a hotel bill or a whiskey bill. Then in the east, I wanted to get a permit to show my curiosities and was refused. Potter explained why he had not returned to Albany to see his children for three years. If I get there with my children, I won't be able to get away. You've seen pretty hard times, I guess. Well, I have had fights with bears, mountain lions, and been run over by wild cattle, and handled pretty roughly. I camped outside of Baltimore with a gypsy. In early 1882, Potter likely returned home to Albany, New York, passing through New York City, and finally finishing the west-to-east race after more than three years. At Albany, he finally returned after being away for four years and may have remarried. His daughters were aged 12 and 7. At some point in 1882, contrary to his family and friends' wishes, Potter left his Albany home and started another long wheelbarrow trip to New Orleans. Wagers were made, and he was to arrive in New Orleans by a certain date. But after two months, his progress was so slow that his backers hedged their bets, and he was left on his own. It was said, quote, He soon degenerated into a penniless tramp. After he reached Tennessee, he decided to head back home. After six months after his start, 
In North Carolina near Salisbury, a train engineer noticed in the glare of the headlights of his train a glimpse of the figure of a white man lying dead by the track. The train stopped, backed up, and train hands picked up the body and put it into the baggage car. The man was dressed in a suit of buckskin clothes and was at once recognized as Lyman Potter. His head had been crushed in, but no other marks were found on his body. He didn't appear to be robbed, and it was supposed that he had been standing near the tracks and was sideswiped by a passing freight train. He had last been seen in Salisbury with his wheelbarrow of curiosities along with his pet wolf. The large wolf was found and was very tame. It would eat out of a person's hand and love to be petted like a cat. The newspaper in Salisbury, North Carolina wrote, it is hardly proper to dismiss the wheelbarrow man without a glimpse of his history and some further notice of his traps. His wheelbarrow is the most dilapidated thing of the kind ever seen here. The wheel was bound up and held together with cords in the most wonderful way, and every part of the thing had been repaired as if the owner was resolved on pursuing its identity forever. It and its contents weighed in all 240 pounds. Contents? Indescribable. A strong man could barely lift the handles to working position, and it seemed incredible that one should push such a load on such an impediment along the common roads of the country. He also had a tame wolf, which it is said had been taught to sing and perform various funny and surprising tricks. Although the wheelbarrow man was a remarkable subject, not for any good he was doing for himself or his family or anyone else, but for his singularity. Letters were found among his things from his family begging him to come home and telling of dear ones who could not hold out if he delayed. Lyman Potter was only 42 years old when he was killed. The news of his death was covered in the newspapers all over the country. Most of them were kind and some of them were rude, glad that he was gone. Potter was buried in Salisbury, North Carolina on April 4th, 1883. Potter's wife of a few months didn't seem too upset by his passing. She was hoping to sell the wheelbarrow for $1,000 and said she probably would sell the wolf to a menagerie. Yes, the wheelbarrow survived its owner. It was eventually sold to James Martin of New Jersey. Gonna try my wheelbarrow. Gonna try my wheelbarrow. Ultra wheelbarrowing did not die with Lyman Potter. Some didn't forget and followed in his footsteps. Hopefully with this episode, the legend of the wheelbarrow man will live on. You might see someone pushing one on a trail near you. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.